But last week we kicked off this series called It's Complicated. Uh, Complex Issues, Simple Solutions. We're looking at the book of Proverbs because the book of Proverbs is the book of wisdom. And last week we talked about how God wants us to be people of wisdom on on the job and in our work and how we can express wisdom in our vocation. And uh, today we want to continue that series. We want to talk a little bit about uh, wisdom in our finances today. And then, of course, next week we're going to talk about the wisdom of the tongue because there's a time to say it and there's a time to zip it. And the Proverbs is going to give us some insights related to the tongue. And then, of course, in week four, we'll look at uh, wise friendships, biblical friendships. How can we be a good friend? How can we look for good friends? And we'll talk about that from the book of Proverbs, which will be great, too. So a great series. And then after that, we're moving into the Christmas season, which we are so pumped about. Our theme this Christmas is Christmas Beats. And you just don't want to miss the Christmas Beats. So I'm telling you, from now to the end of the year, it's just it's going to be great. It's going to be fantastic. I want you to pull out your outlines and your Bibles today, you can follow along with where we're going. And You know, wisdom is so important because um, so we make decisions every day that affect the, the rest of our lives. And we need wisdom. We need wisdom from God. And, and last week we talked about how wisdom is not just knowledge. You can be knowledgeable and smart and not wise. Because wisdom is the ability to, pay, to take knowledge and to apply it into your life. And that's why you have people who have PhDs but they can't uh, balance their own checkbook. You know, because sometimes we have knowledge, but we don't have wisdom. And the key to succeeding in life is to have wisdom. And the Bible tells us that wisdom comes from the fear of God. If you notice in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 6, the Bible says, To understand a proverb and a saying, the, word, the words of the wise and their riddles, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and fools despise wisdom and instruction. In other words, if you're going to understand the book of Proverbs... It starts with the fear of God. And the fear of God is the reverence of God. It's not being afraid of God, but it's the respect of God. So we respect God, we live in awe of God, we reverence God. That is the beginning of all knowledge. If you want to be a person of wisdom, the first thing to do is to learn to fear God, to reverence God, to respect God. And the Bible says the rest of Proverbs will make sense to you. You know, all the riddles and all of the Proverbs and all the sayings well, make sense if you get this one thing right. So we, we have to realize that wisdom comes from God, and it comes by originating in the fear of God. But there's worldly wisdom and there's godly wisdom, and worldly wisdom is, is simply based on human understanding and reasoning and cultural norms. You know, you can be a person that the world says is, is wise, and yet not live by what the Bible says. Because if you're going to live by godly wisdom, you're, you're following the scriptural principles of the Bible, and you're also looking at the world from the vantage point of God. So there is godly wisdom, and there is worldly wisdom, and obviously we want to have godly wisdom, because wisdom comes from God. And listen, godly wisdom will transcend generations. It will transcend uh, cultures. It will transcend time. That's why uh, the, the principles of the Bible were relevant thousands of years ago, they still work today. You know, Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs several thousand years ago, and we're still studying and talking about the book of Proverbs because, because the Word of God is timeless. It, just, it doesn't get out of style. It doesn't get old. It just keeps working because these principles, they're from God. They're deep. They're profound. And uh, we need the wisdom of God, don't we? So I want to talk to you today about the wisdom of God in generosity. Wise people are people who are generous. And generosity is a sign of wisdom, the Bible says. And the Bible tells us that uh, to be generous, uh, we bring the first 10% of our income. We call that a tithe. A tithe is a tenth portion. And when we bring the tenth to God, that is, that is exhibiting wisdom. And I want to give you six reasons why being a generous person will make you a person of wisdom. But to illustrate this, I want to just kind of bring this home a little bit about the tithe thing and the tenth portion. I need a volunteer from the audience today. Can somebody help me out? Okay, Matt right here. Matt, come on up. Let's give it up for Matt. Brave guy, come up here on stage. <clears throat> Matt, come on up here. Stick out your hands, if you will. Okay, there you go. Here, you can just put them together right there. So, Matt, I'm going to make you a deal, buddy. Uh, let's just say that you have nothing, okay? You have no money. 
And uh, let's say that I want to give you a hundred bucks. Would that be cool? Would you be glad you came to church this morning? Somebody's thinking, I should have volunteered. I got some money here, Matt. Let's count this out. Okay. All right. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. All right, so you're doing good, man. You got, you got a lot more than when you came in because you didn't have anything. Now you got 100. Life's pretty good. You got some lunch money today, right? All right, but let's say that I, that I gave you the 100, but I said the only thing that I want back is I want 10. I want $10 back. You know what, Matt, I gave you the 100. You can keep the 90. I just, I just want the 10th portion back. Would you say that would still be a pretty good deal? You still came out ahead, didn't you? Yeah. And that's what tithing is. See, tithing is understanding that God has given us 100% of everything that we have. Everything we have is from God. The car that we drive, the house that we live in, the money we have in the bank, the job that we have, all is from God. God says, you keep the 90, you do whatever you want to with the 90, but I want the 10th. I want the 10th. Let's give it up for Matt. Matt, just hang on to that, buddy. Have a good time. Okay. <laughs> People are like, I like this church, man. <laughs> giving out money, man. That's good. That's good. So God says the tenth or the tithe. The word tithe means the tenth portion or, or one-tenth. And the tithing is wise. And let me give you a couple of reasons today why, why we want to practice generosity and tithing. Because, first of all, it honors the Lord. The Bible says when you tithe, it's an act of wisdom because it honors the Lord. Look at this. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce, and then your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will be bursting with wine. And that first word is the word what? Honor. You ought to underline that. The word honor. See, when we give to God, we honor the Lord. How many of you know that to have successful relationships with people, you have to show honor, right? I mean, if you think you're going to have a, a marriage that's going to last a lo- uh, you know, quite some time, you've got to have honor in the marriage, don't you? If you don't have honor then it's going, to be a rough, it's going to be a rough go at, isn't it? A lot of people don't have honor in the home, and they wonder, why is our marriage struggling? You've got to have honor. And honor is, is showing respect and admiration. So, you know, in the home, when my wife says, Ryan, hey, I really need you to help with the kids. You know, they've been driving me crazy. I've been with them all day. And I'm like, and I'm thinking in my mind, I'm tired. I want to sit on the couch. You know, I've been working all day. But I get up and I help with the kids anyway. I start throwing kids in the bathtub, and I start brushing teeth and all this kind of stuff. What am I doing? I'm showing honor to my wife, right? Yeah, that's good. And, uh, you know, when, when we got a little money left over at the end of the month, and I say, Gina, just take this money, you know, fits in the budget, but here, just, just go shopping, just go do something fun for yourself. You know, she's like, man, thank you. That, that's honor, right? It, it, it honors my wife. And, and to have a healthy marriage, you got to have honor. Listen, in your spiritual relationship, you got to honor God. If you want to be close to God, you want to be connected to God, you want to know God, it begins with honor. And the Bible says we honor God by bringing the first portions of our earnings to Him. And you notice it says there, first fruits. In the ancient world, people didn't have cash and credit cards and, you know, online giving and PayPal and all this stuff. People gave uh, through their fruits, through, through their, uh, their crops. And so they would bring a tenth portion of all of their produce to the house of worship. And that's why the Bible uses the word first fruits, which is a similar idea as the tithe. It represents the first and best going to God. The first portion. And when that happens, we honor the Lord. Look, look Leviticus 27 speaks of this too. One tenth of the produce of the land, whether grain from the fields or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord and must be set apart to Him as holy. In other words, that tenth portion belongs to God. The book of Malachi says when we take what belongs to God that we're actually stealing from Him. And so the tenth portion belongs to Him. And when we bring it, it honors God. It brings honor to Him. It is. So our first and best goes to God. Here's the second thing. Write this down. It not only honors God, but it allows God to bless me. Okay? When, when God has control over our lives, when God has our heart, when God has our possessions, then, then what happens? Then, then we put ourselves in the position to be blessed. You know, you can go through the Bible, whether it's the book of Malachi, the Gospel of Luke, the book of Proverbs, 
where, where there is generosity, there is blessing. It's a principle from the Bible. Notice it here in, in Proverbs 3. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. And then look at verse 10. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. See, you, you, you give to God and God says, I will bless you. A lot of times what we want to do is we want to hang on to all of our stuff and then we wonder, why is God not blessing this? You want to be blessed in your finances? You want to be blessed in your life? Submit that to God. God says, look at this, your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. And this is a verb in the imperfect tense, which means that this is an ongoing process. In other words, you bring the first fruits and then God says, I'll fill up the barns. And you bring the first fruits and God will, will fill up the barns. And you bring the first fruits, and God will fill up the barns. It's a continual process over and over and over again. So you put yourself in the position of blessing when you give generously to God. Look at this in Proverbs eleven twenty four: 24. Give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will, will prosper, and those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. So the Bible is saying that if we want to be blessed, we don't do so by hoarding. See, that, that's the wisdom of the world. The wisdom of the world says, if I want to, 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 to be blessed, I hang on to everything that I've got, I become stingy. God's word says it's actually the opposite. You become a generous person, then God will bless you more than you even thought was possible. So are we hoarding or are we being generous? I was thinking about this in a lot of my own experience a few weeks ago, a couple, actually a couple of months ago. Uh, Gina and I uh, moved into a new house, and we've been working for several years to have a rental property. We're really excited about this. We've been working really diligently. We finally figured out how to do this, and so we moved to another house in the same neighborhood. And the day after the closing, you know what happened? The big hailstorm hit. Do you guys remember that? Just tore up everything. So, so now I've got two roofs that are destroyed, maxed out. And I'm like looking at my finances, and I'm like, God... You know, man, I mean, like, I didn't plan for this. You know, like, I mean, one, one deductible is enough, and now I got two, and, you know, how's this all going to work out? And so, man, several weeks later, God provided an opportunity for me to make some money to pay uh, both of those deductibles. And uh, I, in addition to my normal income, I, did, I didn't have to spend any money out of my savings or anywhere else. God just provided. It's amazing. You know what? When you walk with God, God will bless you. When you bring that, that, that tenth portion to God, God will do things in your life that are unexpected. I was talking with Gina about this the other day, and she said, Ryan, you know, I went to college uh, on a full scholarship, and, and we started talking about that. And I was reminded, Gina's family is a very middle-class family, very average folks, um, always bring the tithe, you know, to the Lord, but just normal people. I mean, very normal people. And uh, her and her identical twin sister were ready to go to college, and uh, the parents had no money to send them to college. And they were like, man, what are we going to do? And about that time, they applied for some scholarships. And Gina and her identical twin sister got full-ride scholarships for four years. They got their entire undergraduate degrees paid for. I'm talking books, meals, dorm room, tuition, the whole shebang, everything paid for. And when Gina graduated from college, she had zero dollars of undergraduate debt. Now, that's pretty cool, isn't it? I mean, it's pretty good. God blesses. I believe that we're being blessed by the faithfulness of Gina's parents. Isn't that great? See, when you walk with God, your other generations will be blessed. They will. And, and Gina's identical twin sister, both of them got these scholarships. Now, you may say, yeah, but your wife's really smart. And you know what? She is. She's pretty smart. <laughs> she is. But you know what? There's a lot of smart people that got a lot of debt from college, right? And I, I, I believe that, that, that Gina was just being being blessed. So when we walk with God, when we walk with God, we put him first, God will begin to bless us. And some, for some of us, it's easy to put God first in every area of our life but our finances. You know, every church in town is filled with people that will read their Bible, come to church, will serve, bring their friends, do whatever. But you know what? Don't talk to me about the tithe. Don't talk to me about the giving. And yet, you know what? The Bible says when God has our finances, he has our heart. And I believe this is why God emphasizes giving so much. It's not because God needs the money. God created the heavens and the earth. There's nothing that God needs. But God wants you. 
And God wants your heart. And when God has our finances, God has us. And that's why he instructs us to give and to be generous. And that's why we're doing the 90-day tithe challenge today. There's a packet there underneath uh, the chair in front of you if you're interested. And here's what the 90-day tithe challenge is. It's based on Malachi chapter 3. And basically, if you want to commit to bring the full tithe for 90 days, and you know what? You don't believe that God has blessed you in some way. The church will refund all of your money for those 90 days with no hassle. Because, see, we believe that putting God to the test, we believe that the giving generously to God will always bring about God's blessings in our lives. And so we want to encourage you to do it. You know, now I hope you tithe a lot longer than 90 days. I hope it becomes a lifestyle for you as it has many people here at Edge Church. But, but, you know, if you're just trying to put your toe in the water and you're like, ah, I'm not really sure about all this stuff. This is kind of new for me. Then take the packet, fill it out. We'll get you signed up. It's going to be exciting. We'd love to have you participate with us. Here's the third thing. Number three, generosity protects me from becoming selfish. The world of the generous gets larger and larger, and the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. See, when we're selfish, our world gets small because all we think about is ourself. When we're generous, our world gets bigger. Look at 1 Timothy 6.10. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Did you know almost 80% of people who are in jail are in jail re related to something with finances and money? Do you know that the number one piece, reason people get divorced is not because of adultery, it's because of, it's because of money, finances. So see, when we get the generosity thing in order, then we begin to break the stranglehold of greed in our life. Now, I'm a pastor, and I've had people come in my office and, and confess all kinds of sins. I mean, sins you didn't even know existed. You know, I've heard about them. people struggling with all kinds of things. But I have never had one person come into my office and say, Ryan, I'm really struggling with being greedy. You know? I'm a greedy sucker. Pray for me. You know why? Because greed is one of those it's one of those sins that lurks deep in the heart, and, and you don't even know it's there a lot of times. It's a subtle sin. There's a lot of sins that are real, real public, you know, like people see them. We see them. There's some that, that kind of lurk in the shadows. They're kind of in the crevices, in the darkness, you know, if you will. And that's what greed is. Greed is something that we just don't see as often as we should, but it is there. It's kind of like jealousy and envy. You know, it's kind of subtle, subterranean, but it is there. And listen, the way that you break the power of greed in your life is by being generous. See, you begin to put up a shield of protection against being, being a person that's greedy when you begin to be a person of generosity. And that's why Paul warns Timothy, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Money is not the root of all evil. Okay, Money is not good or bad. It's the love of money. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil. So we need to love God more than we love our stuff. The love of money. The world of the generous gets larger and larger. And the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller, the scripture said. This is why I love to teach my kids to tithe. My kids, they get an allowance and they have a Jesus jar, you know. And so we teach our kids to give and they put a portion of their uh, allowance in the Jesus jar is teaching them to give. They give a tithe, and then if they want to give an offering, which is above the tenth, then then they they have the opportunity to do that, and they can determine whatever amount that that is. And you know, sometimes it's a little more, and sometimes it's a little less. And my kid, they just love it. You know, isn't it great to see kids excited about giving? You know, it is. I asked my seven-year-old boy. I said, Zane, is there anything you want me to tell the church about tithing tomorrow? And he said, yeah, Dad. He said, tell them that, okay, this is from my seven-year-old, okay? <laughs> he said, tell them that we give to God because God has first given to us. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? I like that. Yeah, God's given us the hundred. He said, you know what? You can keep the 90. I just want the 10 back. That's still a great deal, isn't it? Love that. The psychiatrist Carl Menninger, who was... Uh, a psychiatrist in the 20th century, he did a lot of study on generosity. And he did a lot of study with people who had mental illness. And this is the conclusion that he came to at the end of his life before he died. He said, people who are generous are almost never mentally ill. He went on to say that generosity is one of the essential co components to mental health. You want to be a healthy person, be a person that's generous. 
See, sometimes when we get into this world of selfishness and self-indulgence, there's so many other problems that come with that. When we were talking about 1 Timothy, where it says the root of the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, you know, when you love money, it drags all these other sins with it. Envy, jealousy, competition, all these things. It, it starts with the root of it is the, the love of money, but with all this other stuff, it begins to suck us under. You begin to break the hold of, of stinginess and, 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 and this is mine by being a generous person, by being generous. Here's the fourth thing. Not only does it protect me from selfishness, but it makes me trust God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and, and uh, He will make your paths straight. Uh, but do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. And notice this in verse 9, because verse 9 is connected to verse 5. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with new wine. So we love Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. The context of Proverbs 3, 5 is 9 and 10. So we have trust in the Lord and then we have finances. Isn't it interesting that the Bible brings those two together? Why? Because the greatest area of faith for most of us is our money. That's the most sensitive area of our life, you know? Most of us are, are, are not, you know, worried about this or about that. But man, the money, man, that gets sensitive. So we got to trust God. Trust God. I believe that faith is like a muscle. It's kind of like the first time you go to the gym and you start to work. You haven't worked out in a few years and you start to, you know, you, you get, get on the bench press or maybe you run on the treadmill. What happens the next day? Oh, you're sore. Yeah, you're hurting, limping around. Some people quit, you know, they're like, oh, I'm not going back. That was bad. <laughs> but what happens if you keep going to the gym, you, you build up the muscles, don't you? And then, you know, a couple of months later, you're doing the same workout that you did on the first day and you don't even feel it. Why? Because you, you've grown in strength and faith is a muscle. And when you exercise the muscle of generosity, it grows and it becomes stronger. Listen, if you can believe God in your finances, you can believe God for anything. You can believe God for your health, for your family, for your future, for your job, whatever it is. And that's why the, the writer of the Proverbs puts, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your, on your own understanding with honor the Lord with your wealth and your first fruits. Because we don't want to be wise in our own eyes. See, see you, you notice here he says there in verse 7, look at it again. Don't be wise in your own eyes. People who are wise in their own eyes see no need to be generous. See, that, that, that's the wisdom of God. And many times the wisdom of God is counterintuitive. The wisdom of God in many respects can be the opposite of what we've been taught our whole life, what the culture says, what our friends say, even what our family says. Listen, we need to hear what God says. We need to hear what God says. And finances is his greatest area of testing uh, for our faith, isn't it? So it makes me trust God. You get your finances under the authority of God, your faith will grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And you may be thinking, well, Ryan, this sounds great, but how does that happen? How does that happen? The fifth thing is this. You see, tithing teaches me discipline in my spending. That's how it begins to work. Listen, if you're going to be a generous person... You've got, to, you've got to plan that out. You've got to, you've got to work that plan. It's rare that somebody is generous who is not planned. You've got to have a budget. Sometimes we make a budget, and then three months later, we can't find the budget. You know, I made the budget. Yeah. You've you got to put God, number one, in the budget. For Gina and I, God gets paid first. God gets paid before the mortgage, before the groceries, before the car payment, before anything else, God is number one. If nobody else gets paid that month, God gets paid first. He's number one. Put him at the top. If you don't put him at the top, if you put him at the bottom, what will happen? You'll wait to the end of the month, and every month you'll see what you have left over, and there'll be nothing left. There won't be anything there. So you need a plan. you got to develop a plan. Look at this. Proverbs 16 says, We should make plans counting on God to direct us. Okay? 
Now, God, I'm going to make a plan. I don't understand it all. Don't got all the answers. This is kind of what I'm thinking. God, I'm counting on you to direct me, to help me navigate through that, to weave through that. Make your plan, counting on God to direct you. Look at this in Proverbs 21.5. The plans of the diligent lead surely to plenty, but those of everyone who is hasty surely to poverty. So are we being diligent? Are we putting that plan together? I was talking with one of our uh, young couples in our church that uh, was sharing with me a little bit about their journey in tithing. And they said, Ryan, we moved into a, an apartment that was smaller than what we wanted to move into uh, because we wanted to tithe. And so we, you know, we realized we did a plan and we realized we weren't going to have enough to live in that apartment. So we, so we bumped it down a notch. Furthermore, we decided to not have internet and cable for a couple of years so we could tithe. You know what began to happen? God began to bless their finances. Their, their finances began to grow. And it wasn't too long after that they were able to move out of that apartment into a house. And now they have internet and cable. Isn't that great? Isn't that good? Yeah. You're like, oh, I'm blessed, you know. Yeah. You make some sacrifices on the front end and you see what God will do in your life. You put God first. Put God number one. Don't put him at the bottom. You know, work within your margin. Work within your plan. And see what God will do. And we have seen people in our, in our church here at Edge Church work two jobs to make sure they could tithe. And every time I've seen that happen, God has blessed those people in crazy, crazy ways. You see, sometimes we're operating with our finances out of human understanding, out of what we can understand, and we leave God out of the equation. We need God. We need God. So we need a plan. I was thinking about this this week. I was reminded that my very first church job, I made $22,000 a year. I felt, I felt like I had killed it, you know. It's like 22000 you know, awesome. And now I look at that and I'm like, man, how do we eat? You know, I mean, it was crazy. But you know what? You adjust your lifestyle to where you're at. Some of you in this room are making $22,000 a year, maybe a little bit less. You know what? You just adjust your lifestyle, don't you? And then when you get a raise and you get an increase, you get a little more experience, you know, you, you, you grow in your skill set, you make a little bit more, then you can adjust your lifestyle, okay? And you can have a little bit more. You drive a little nicer car than what you drove, you know, when you were 22. And then, then you can adjust that a little bit more. But you know, the problem a lot of people have is they adjust their lifestyle up faster than their income. And so I've got this kind of income, but I'm trying to live this kind of lifestyle. And that's why people say, I can't afford to tithe. Listen, you can't afford to not tithe. You need God in your finances. You need God involved. And there will always be a reason to not give. There will always be a reason. You know, when you're younger, it's I don't have enough. And when you get a little older, it's I got a plan for my kid's college and I got a retirement. And there's always a reason to not give. There, there, there always is. It's just a different, it just has a different flavor, a different shape to it. But when we begin to put God at the top of that budget, then that's when God begins to bless us. That's when the barns begin to be filled with abundance. And it's amazing. We want God to bless what doesn't belong to him. So start where you are, do what you can, work with what you've got, and watch God do a great work in your life. And you know what? You will learn discipline in times where you have less. Do you know that? If, you, if your first job you were making this much money, then you would live that lifestyle and you wouldn't learn the discipline of what it's like to make $22,000 a year when you get out of college. You know, that's what forces you to pinch the pennies and balance the checkbook and say, no, I don't think we can do that. That's good. That's good for life. That's good. That's good. I, I have found in my own experience that I have been more disciplined in my money because I've got 90 instead of 100, that I've been a better steward of the 90. And I believe that I've managed the 90 better. Whereas if I'd had the 100, I would have had more room to just kind of throw money at stuff and do whatever. It's more structured. It's more planned. God will do that in your life. So do you have a plan? But here's the final thing, and this is so good. It brings me joy. See, giving is joyful. Paul uh, said, uh, uh, God loves a cheerful giver. Love that. Gener a generous man, Proverbs eleven twenty five 25 says, will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. And that just makes me smile. You know? When, when generosity gets in your bones, you know, gets in your spirit, becomes part of your spiritual discipline, it brings you joy. You know, you smile. 
You know, sometimes at the end of the year, I get that, that receipt from the church that says what, we've, what our contributions are to turn into the, uh, to the uh, CPA. And uh, I look at that amount and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I could have done a lot of other things with that money. You know, and for a few seconds, I'll think, man, I could have gone on this vacation. I could have done this. I could have done that, blah, 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 you know, all that. But then I'm reminded of all the great things God has done in our church. And it brings me joy. I think about all the salvations. I think about people committing their lives to Christ every single Sunday here at Edge Church. I think about the baptisms like crazy. I think about the marriages that have been saved. I think about my kids learning the word of God every single week here at Edge Church. I think about the kids in Haiti that we're feeding the orphans. I think about the orphans in Swaziland that we're helping. I think about what God's doing here in our own community and the way we're helping and serve families and single moms and all this stuff. And I'm like, it brings me joy. It feels good. It feels good to give. And a generous man will prosper. It will refresh others. We need to be refreshing others, don't we? I love that. So in conclusion... It's wise to be generous. It is. It it honors the Lord. It allows God to bless me. It protects me from becoming selfish. It makes me trust God. It teaches me discipline, and it brings me joy. And that's why we give to God.